Images have local structure. Pixels that are nearby in an image are likely to be similar. They may be a similar colour and they're quite likely to be materially related. Pixels that are a long way apart may well be very different and they're more likely to be unrelated. This kind of structure is a consequence of the image formation process. It arises because the image comes from capturing details of a physical reality. The pixels in the image reflect objects in the scene. Those objects have coherent structure. They're made of the same material. They can't just be randomly spread out across the visual field. There is a spatial relationship between the pixels and the physical scene, and the physical scene needs to obey the laws of physics. Obviously, this last is not strictly true of artificial images. With drawings and paintings, you can have anything in the scene. With computer graphics renderings, you can do what you like. And yet, we still tend to impose a lot of the same kinds of conventions of relatedness on the images that we create because we're used to the rules of behaviour of the physical world. This kind of local relatedness of pixels need not be smooth. Objects may be textured or patterned, but there will be some kind of systematic relationship. And places where this kind of local relatedness breaks down, discontinuities in the image like edges and corners reflect some kind of physical meaning that makes them actually interesting. They represent the boundaries of objects, which gives them a semantic relevance. So we're focusing on images in this section, but as mentioned previously, many of the same considerations apply to digital signals in general. So, for example, audio signals are constrained because they arise from the vibration of physical objects, which again have to obey the laws of physics. They have to vibrate continuously through space. They can't teleport from one place to another, and so they can't have a perfect step response, for example. Actually, nobody cares about this. A tool that we're going to use to try and pick out the interesting features in images, including things like these discontinuities, the edges and corners, are convolutions. So if you have a background in physics or engineering, you've probably encountered convolutions before, say in the context of Fourier analysis. For continuous signals and general functions, convolutions are a kind of integral transform, which would be represented like this. Essentially, one function is being combined with the other at all possible offsets between one and the other. These kind of operations occur when some kind of spatial or temporal effect, such as optical blurring or reverberation, applies to some other signal at every point in time or space. The blur or echo at each point kind of smears over and adds on to the blurs or echoes from every other point. As a result of this, convolution in the spatial domain can be quite expensive to compute because lots of things are happening lots of times. You might remember something known as the convolution theorem, which demonstrates that uh, convolutions in the space-time domain are equivalent to pointwise multiplication in the frequency domain and vice versa. This is something that can be uh, very useful for improved efficiency and is one of the reasons why we use Fourier transforms. For our current problems, however, we're interested in discrete signals. In this case, convolution becomes essentially a sliding window dot product. So some signal or piece of signal represented by just a vector of numbers is moved to every position along another signal, the input signal, and the dot product is calculated and that gives the new signal for each location. In the case of images, both of these signals, the uh, fragment or filter that we're applying and the input image are two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So they're matrices or tensors. 
but it's important to remember that the convolution is always computing just a dot product. It is not computing a matrix multiplication or a tensor product. It is simply the weighted sum of all of the things in one signal multiplied by all of the things in the other. The piece of signal that we multiply at every point is known as a filter or a kernel. The latter is a bit unhelpful. It's important to distinguish between this kind of kernel used in convolutions and the kernels we used with support vector machines. There is under the hood some kind of relationship between them, but for practical machine learning purposes, they're completely different things. The kernels in convolution participate in the inner product. They don't try to bypass it in the way that the kernel functions for SVMs and other kernel methods do. So the signal fragment, this filter or kernel, will be dotted with the input signal at every different location. Remember that we can think of the dot product as a kind of similarity metric. So one way of interpreting the uh, convolution is checking the similarity between the filter and the target signal at every location. If you think of the filter kernel having high values and low values, it has peaks and troughs and so does the input signal. When the peaks of the kernel line up with the peaks in the input signal and the troughs of the kernel line up with the troughs of the input signal, then the output of the dot product will be high. Conversely, if the peaks in the filter line up with troughs in the input signal and the troughs in the filter line up with peaks in the input signal, then in both cases they'll sort of cancel each other out and you'll wind up with a low output from the dot product. So filter kernels can be thought of as detectors that search for matches in the input signal and give a high output when they find something that's close to what they're looking for and give a low output the rest of the time. Because a filter is applied at every location in the input signal, it ought to find the things that it's looking for wherever they happen to be. If some feature that we're looking for um, is moved to a different place in the input signal, then the detection high point for the filter will also move equivalently. This is known as translational equivariance, and it's one of our structural priors for images. What we would like from, say, a cat detector applied to an image is that it should find the cat wherever in the image it happens to be. It shouldn't be restricted to a particular location. If it can find a cat in the top left-hand corner of the image, then it should still be able to find the cat when the cat moves to the bottom right. Convolution filters as uh, feature detectors are nothing new. They've been used in uh, image processing and digital signal processing for many years. And people have uh, carefully designed various kinds of filters for detecting certain kinds of features. So there are edge detecting filters such as the Sobel filters. And there are filters for detecting local textural patches like Gabor filters. We'll look at both of these in a second. Convolutions are also one of the main workhorse tools for digital image processing in general. They're used for blurring and for sharpening, for emphasis of particular kinds of detail and for adding particular kinds of texture. If you've ever used Instagram or Photoshop, then you've definitely used engineered convolution filters. Let's look at a couple of examples. These are the kernels of Sobel filters that detect vertical and horizontal edges. This is just a simple three by three kernel. The center row or the center column is zeros, then the column on one side is negative, the column on the other side is positive. And similarly for the rows, this detects edges because it looks for a high value on one side of the center and a low value on the other. When you apply a filter like this to an image, you get this kind of embossing effect. You'll see 
that the edges on one side are light and the edges on the other side are dark. The standard method for doing edge detection is to take the magnitude of these signals both with the horizontal edge detector and the vertical edge detector and combine them and you wind up with an image like this where the light colour shows the edges that have been found around the objects in the image. As another example, Gabor filters look like this. They combine a sinusoidal grating of some frequency with an exponential decay. So they only concentrate on a small patch of the image and within that patch they find small texture elements consisting of repeated light and dark bands. When you apply these kinds of filters to an image, you get, well, in the case of the first one, you just get a localized blurring. It doesn't have um, any significant uh, sinusoidal component. In the case of this filter, you get this kind of effect. In the case of the third filter, you get this effect. In each case, we're picking out finer and more directional textural details. So this is all well and good. But we don't want to manually design filters to pick out specific features of interest. We want to learn them from the data. We want filters that will be useful for solving the particular problems at hand. This means we need to embed them in a network graph for which we can calculate the weight gradients by backpropagation and then update them using stochastic gradient descent or some related method. Convolutions, as I've described them, are a little bit different from the kinds of neural network layers we've seen so far, but ultimately they're going to boil down to the same basic operations. There'll be an inner product between the weights and the input and some kind of nonlinear activation applied to it. So the difference is mostly in how the data and the weights are organized. Images and the outputs of convolutional filters applied to them have a 2D planar spatial structure. They have a spatial extent in two dimensions and within that they are sampled on a uniform grid. But we will also consider images to have depth. So rather than just being a 2D plane, they occupy some volume. For standard input images, that depth dimension will represent colour. Typically, there will be three channels representing, say, red, green and blue. You might also have a grayscale image, in which case the depth would only be one channel, but we would still consider that the image represents a volume. The output of a single convolutional filter will be a similar spatial grid of filter responses at each of the locations in the signal. This is often known as a feature map, representing the uh, degree to which a particular feature was detected at each location. So for example, a cat feature map would include high values wherever a cat was detected in the image. This single filter output, like the grayscale input image, would again be a volume of depth 1. However, convolutional layers in neural networks will usually have a large number of separate filters. And the output of the layer is a volume where there is a separate planar channel for each of the filter outputs. Each convolutional filter will typically have only a small spatial extent. They might occupy 3 by 3 pixels or 5 by 5 or perhaps 7 by 7, but they will also extend all the way through the input volume, whatever that is. So in the first input image, if the input is in color, then the convolutional kernel will go through all three color channels and will have weights associated with every location in every channel. So in that case, say a three by three convolutional filter would have three by three by the three channels. So that's 27 separate weights and usually also a bias. So there would be 28 parameters associated with that one filter. For convolutional layers deeper in the network that are taking the output of previous convolutional layers, the volume that they accept might be much deeper. 
So if a layer has 128 filters, say, then it will emit a volume that has a depth of 128. And the filters for the next layer, even if they have a small spatial extent, let's say they're still 3x3, three three, they will have a much greater depth extent because they'll have to go through all 128 of the channels from the previous layer. So the filter kernel size in that case will be 3 by 3 by 128, again plus one bias. Each of the filters has only one set of weights though. The same set of weights is applied at every location in the input image. So all of the output features, um, which we might think of as output neurons, one at each spatial location in the image within the feature map, all of those will be using the same set of weights to generate their output. This improves the memory efficiency over a fully connected network because there are many fewer parameters for each filter. It also has a kind of regularizing effect because it encourages the filter to be useful everywhere. It helps to impose our inductive bias of translational equivariance. This should help prevent the filter from getting too hung up on specific things in specific places. By comparison, in a fully connected network, each of the output neurons in a layer is performing a weighted sum, an inner product, over all of the pixels in the input image. This can be considered as a convolution kernel, the size of the whole image, but it's only used once. It has no room to be slid across the image. When we come to train this kind of convolutional network, we want to update our convolutional filter weights. There's a separate gradient for each of the output locations, but there's only one set of weights. We accumulate, we add up basically all of the gradient updates from all of the different locations, and then we use that to update the single set of weights. It's equivalent to doing a mini batch update over all of the different locations. When we're applying a filter kernel to an image, we want to slide it across at lots of different positions. But at each position, there has to be some input value that's associated with each of the weights in the kernel. So the kernel has to fit inside the image data. A consequence of this is that if the filter kernel has a spatial dimension of greater than one, then it can fit into the image fewer times than there are locations in the image, which means that the output feature map would have a smaller spatial extent than the input image. We can get around this by adding padding around the sides of the input data, the image or the outputs from an earlier layer, allowing the kernel to fit in all the way up to the edges. So I've said that the filter kernel is applied everywhere at every location in the image, but this doesn't have to be the case. The step size that you advance the filter across the image is known as the stride. If the stride is one, then you're moving to every available location. But if you have a larger stride, a stride of two, for example, then you're stepping over alternate locations. And again, as with the unpadded image, you will wind up with an output spatial size, which is smaller than the input spatial size. The relationship between the input size and the output size, given a kernel size and amount of padding and stride, is expressed like this. So given a kernel size k, an input dimension of d in, a stride s, and an amount of padding p, we can calculate the output dimension as d out equals d in minus k plus 2p, all of that divided by s plus 1 at the end. I'm treating this as if all of these things are the same in both spatial dimensions. This will almost always be true, although it is possible to have different strides, kernel sizes, and image dimensions in both directions, in which case the same formula applies in each direction. A common tactic is to have a stride of one and to set the padding so that it mops up the kernel so that the input size and the output size will be the same. 
So if you think back to our discussion of what's happening in successive layers in a fully connected network and how each layer is building on the features in the previous one, in general with convolutional networks, we want to do the same kind of thing. So deeper layers will be building up aggregate features that are combinations of the features in earlier layers. But as well as increasing complexity, we all typically want to be considering a greater spatial extent in the deeper layers. So in the early layers, we'll have tiny features like local edges and patches and blobs, and we'll build those up into bigger compound features which aggregate those kinds of edges over a larger area to construct, say, a cat. So as we get deeper into the network, we want to be able to consider a larger area. One way to do this would be just to have bigger filter kernels in deeper layers, but commonly what we will instead do is use some kind of spatial reduction as you get deeper so that then you're aggregating over a wider area. The most common mechanism for this is pooling. So after some number of convolutional layers, you take small patches of the feature maps resulting and summarize them into smaller patches. Typically, this will be by taking the maximum activation over that small patch. So for example, you would look at two by two patches of the image and you would take the highest activation in each feature map forward into a single pixel to be passed to the next convolutional layer. The intuition of max pooling is that if you've detected a feature anywhere in that region, then that counts as there being that feature in that region. If you had a cat detector at any of those locations, that would mean there was definitely a cat somewhere in the region. By pooling, you sacrifice some of the spatial resolution of where the cat is, but in return, you will be able to do your analysis, your feature matching and so on over larger and larger regions of the image and building up much more complex objects that you're looking for. One thing to note when doing max pooling is that the back, back propagated gradient through a max pooling operation is zero for any of the things that never contributed. So only the high chosen activation actually propagates further back into the network. Usually this shouldn't be a problem because there's no particular rhyme or reason to the activation being in a particular location for any given input image. An alternative to max pooling is average pooling, where instead of taking the maximum over your little region, you instead take the average. In this case, backpropagation works everywhere, but you weaken the forward signal coming through the pooling. So if there's a high cat detection in one location in the region and low cat detection in the others, then your output will be a weaker cat signal overall. Both pooling and using a stride of greater than one will shrink the output image and can achieve a similar effect in terms of allowing filters to look at larger and larger image regions. Stride will be faster just because it does the dot product at fewer locations. But by the same token, because it's stepping over locations, it might miss positions of high activation. A max pooling, on the other hand, will still do the computation at every location, which means it's doing more number crunching and it'll be slower, but it's not going to miss any features. It will pick up that high cat activation in a particular place that might otherwise be missed. In general, pooling is more commonly used, but as usual, there's a trade-off. The spatial extent of the input to which a particular filter is sensitive is known as its receptive field. In terms of sensitivity to immediate inputs, this is bounded by the kernel size. It's not possible for the filter to detect things outside the region that it's searching. The receptive field may in fact be smaller than the kernel size if, for example, the kernel has lots of zeros around the edges. But the receptive field with respect to the original input image might be much larger because of the shrinking effect of pooling or striding operations along the way. Again, this is what allows the convolutional network to aggregate complicated features over a larger spatial extent to build up models of big and interesting objects. 
the output activations, the volume of feature maps that come out of a convolutional layer, represent a projection of the original input into a new basis, a new feature space. This feature space, given that the network has been trained, should be optimized for the task at hand. So for example, if the task is image classification, then the features in the feature maps that come out of the convolutional layer should in some way have been optimized to make the classes that we're trying to classify more distinguishable. If the problem is some image to image regression problem, say for example, image denoising, where we're trying to reproduce what the image would have looked like if there wasn't you know, fuzz and noise applied to it, then the output features should be such to make it easier to reconstruct the bits of the image that we're interested in without the bits that we're not interested in. So separating the signal from the noise. Typically with a convolutional neural network, at the end of a whole series of convolutional layers, you'll wind up with a representation that you pass to some other network structure to actually perform the final task. So for example, you might send your map of convolutional feature activations to a fully connected layer to generate the output logits for the final classification. We can apply a similar interpretation to all of the intermediate layers though. So the convolutional feature maps output from the first layer will have been optimized to make it easier for the second layer to do its task of producing a more optimal feature representation itself, and so on all the way through the network. What constitutes a good convolutional feature representation will depend on the task at hand. However, because images all have a lot of similarities in terms of the structure and behavior, some kinds of features tend to emerge pretty much consistently. The early layers of convolutional neural networks will often exhibit a kind of convergent evolution, settling on filters that really resemble quite closely the kinds of edge detectors and texture patch detectors that computer vision researchers might engineer by hand. Things like the Sobel and Gabor filters turn up pretty often. The deeper layers in the network tend to be uh, a lot less interpretable and a lot more task specific. So for example, if the final task didn't ever care about whether there were humans or animals in the images, then it would be very unlikely that you would wind up with a person or a cat detector in the deep layers. Like lots of kinds of neural networks, the interpretation of deep convolutional networks can be quite a challenge. The processes that drive the uh, evolution of particular kinds of convolutional filters in deep network layers are pretty opaque and it can be quite difficult to figure out what the features and the decision processes that the network is doing actually are. For the earlier layers it's sometimes possible to get a sense of what's going on just by visualizing the filter weights directly. Here, for example, is a set of first layer filters from a pre-trained ResNet 18 model. And you can see that the kinds of Gabor gratings that I discussed before do indeed show up here. For later layers, it's pretty much impossible to interpret the filters that way because you don't really even know what the input features that the filter is aggregating over R, so it's impossible to understand what this combination of those compound features of compound features of compound features actually represents. However, there is a neat trick that allows us to visualize, if not necessarily understand, the neuronal processes and responses going on in deep networks, and it comes as a kind of byproduct of backpropagation. 
So in backpropagation, we compute all of the gradients all the way through the model with respect to the weights and also with respect to the inputs. When we're training the model, we use these gradients to update the weights, but we don't do anything with the inputs. It doesn't make sense to update the data to better fit the model. The data is our training set. That is what we're working towards. The model is the thing that we're changing. But once we have a trained model, we can use the same gradients, keep the weights fixed, and instead update the input to see what is driving responses in particular parts of the model. The upshot is that we generate images by gradient descent, gradually changing the input pixels to maximize the activation of individual neurons or prediction classes or whole layers. And we thereby generate images that very strongly embody what particular neurons or prediction classes are tuned to respond to. Doing this may or may not be specifically informative, but it does sometimes give an intuitive grasp of the kinds of things that are contributing to the model's behavior. It can also produce some pretty psychedelic images. The technique was popularized widely by the Deep Dream application in which particular prediction classes are maximized starting from known images. So to just round up on convolutional networks, these networks have been around for a long time. Precursors of them date back to the beginning of the 1980s and Jan Le Kuhn, um, famously had successes with them at the end of the 1980s on handwritten digit recognition. But the current renaissance of uh, convolutional neural network applications really dates back to um, AlexNet and its success at the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge in 2012, where it demonstrated much stronger performance than people had previously seen. This was followed in quick succession by a series of further advances. And since then, the progress in image classification, image segmentation, object detection, in things like image generation with variational autoencoders and generative adversarial networks, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, all of this progress has been very rapid and impressive. And at the time of recording, CNNs with various tweaks that have been, been added to them probably remain really the king of the hill for image processing problems. Although with some competition from recurrent neural networks, which we'll talk about in the next video. Convolutional networks are also extremely well supported by standard frameworks and libraries, and so it's pretty easy to put them to work. As with everything in deep learning, they are computationally very intensive and they're also enormously data hungry. However, partly because they are so popular and widely used, there are some tricks we can use to get around this latter problem at least a bit, and we'll discuss those in the final video of this week's lectures.